happened down in the foyer downstairs or the Friday Blast. We all appreciate your support and we would all love to see you all there. Thanks. Now the third Sunday of every month we do uh, we do something that's we just started doing a couple a couple of months ago and and uh, we kind of like it. We want to acknowledge you if you've had a birthday this month or you will have a birthday this month or you have an anniversary this month. So if you happen to have a birthday in October, October. <laughs> then then come back in October and we'll recognize you. If you had a birthday this month, please please stand. Yeah, March. March. Stay standing. Stay standing. I think we're handing out the last one or two, and uh, we're going to sing happy birthday to everybody. So, and we, when we sing happy birthday, we sing happy birthday, God bless you, okay? Because it's hard to say everybody's name all at once. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, give them a hand. Somebody's happy. Now, we also had anniversaries this month of March. And uh, so if you had an anniversary, please stand. <laughs> you got to be able to catch if it's your anniversary. So just so you know, the, the birthday gift is a, is a Hershey's chocolate bar, and the um, anniversary gift, oh, there we go, <laughs> anniversary gift is a, a little pack of uh, Hershey's Kisses, because we know that it takes lots of kisses to stay together. <laughs> if you had an anniversary, please stand up again, and let's give those folks a hand. So two days ago, we celebrated St. Patrick's Day, and much to uh, many people's chagrin, St. Patrick's Day is not about uh, uh, leprechauns or green beer. St. Patrick's Day is about a man who God used to revolutionize and change Ireland. And many people think that civilization as we know it would not be what it is without what St. Patrick did. He, he took the gospel, I mean, truly the gospel. He wasn't just a religious guy. He was truly a follower of Jesus, and he took the gospel into a very dark place, a place that he had actually been enslaved in for six years as a teenager. And he went back because the love of Jesus transformed him so that he couldn't help but share the gospel with the folks of Ireland. And before we sing a song, I wanted to end our time right here with a prayer that he prayed. Pray with me. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger, in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name, amen. Welcome to head down to Kid Zone. If you are a visitor here with us and you have some children and you're not quite sure what Kid Zone is all about, I would invite you to go down and check it out for yourself. You would just go out these back doors, take a right, go down the stairs, and someone will meet you there and show you around Kid Zone and give you the lay of the land for that. While the parents are going down, just to give them a minute to get down there, check their kids in, and come back. I want to give you a quick update on our children's ministry. We've been talking about um, Kid Zone for uh, the last several uh, weeks, and um, a lot of really fun and exciting things are happening. We've had several people say, "You know what? I want to invest in kids," and um, 
one of the most exciting things to me is one of the men came up to me last week and he said, Len, what would you think if I were to, um, if I were to try to recruit some guys to be part of Kid Zone? One of the things that we see happen and one of the phenomenons of the church is that when a, when a teenager hits the age of 17, they generally will check out of the church and, and not come back. And sometimes when they get married and have children, they'll come back to the church. But oftentimes, 80% of those kids don't come back. And one of the things that, that we think is happening is little boys in particular, when they get into Sunday school, all they ever see is, is ladies. And we love the ladies to be in their teaching, but little boys also need a male figure to show them that this is important to me. And so this man came up to me and said, I want to be that guy. I want to recruit a, a, a group of men who are going to help us do that. So inside your bulletin, there's an announcement about that and a way you can get involved with that. If you want to, to do that with us, we would very much welcome you and be glad to have you on that team. If you don't want to teach, you won't have to teach. If you want to teach, you can. If you don't want to sing, you don't have to sing. If you don't want to we won't make you do anything you don't want to do. We just want a male presence down there to help us out. Um, okay, so I want to start off today just a little bit differently. I want to give you a chance to ask you to think about something with me. Take a moment and think about a time in your life when you willingly listened to the advice of someone you admired and trusted. Think about a time in your life when you willingly listened to the advice of someone you admired and trusted. Reflect in that situation. What was happening at the time? What was the problem or the task you had to deal with? Where were you when you faced that challenge? What was the decision that you needed to make? Who else was going to be affected by your choice? Did you have hours, days, weeks to agonize over your decision? Or did it just happen in moments? What was the advice they gave you? Now let me ask you the question I'm really after. What was it about that person that caused you to decide that you could trust them? Why did you think that they were a credible source? Think about that. I want to hear from you. Why did you think you could trust that person? Why were they credible? What was it about them? They regularly speak God's truth. Why else? They've been there before. They've been there before. They had some experience. <laughs> and there's the wisest man in the room. Someone else? Unconditional love. They're a wise teacher. Okay, Now, credibility, credulity, believability, veracity. How do we know who we can believe? How do we know who we can trust? A couple of men, uh, last names of Kuznis and Posner, and some of you in the business uh, arena will recognize that name, those names. They wrote a book, uh, an actual kind of a business tome many, many years ago. It's in its fifth edition now called the Leadership Challenge. And they answered this question. How do you know somebody's credible? By interviewing over, well, several thousand workers in, in several different disciplines from the military to, to different um, private sectors throughout the, the country. And they came up with observations from all these different people and boiled them down to four character qualities. Four characteristics of credibility. You can know that somebody is credible when these four things are part of their character. First, they are competent. They know what's going on. They know what direction they should go. And they're, they're someone that you want to follow because of that. Second, they're honest. They're people of integrity. They're people who are trustworthy. Third, they're forward-thinking. They don't just think about the here and now. They don't just think about themselves. They're not gathering things just for themselves. They're thinking about the team, and they're thinking about how do we move forward and accomplish something worthwhile. And fourth, 
They're inspiring. They're people who make you want to do something worthwhile. They summarized the leadership credibility challenge with this simple statement. They said, people will not believe the message unless they believe the messenger. The heart of this whole sermon series comes from a couple of verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that, that Paul, 1 Corinthians 4, excuse me, that Paul wrote. He said in verse 3 and 4, and these are going to be on the screen, so I want to read these together, okay? Let's read this with me. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. So my simple summary of that is that I don't defer to what you think. I'm not guided by my own opinions. The voice that rings most clearly in my head should be God's voice. I should care most about what he thinks about what's going on in my life, decisions I should make, directions I should choose. The disciple of Jesus, as we say in our discipleship, is first and foremost concerned that they're connected with God, that we know who he is, and that we have a real and vital relationship with him. And the more you get to know God, the more you love God. And the more you grow in your, the depth of your love for God, the more you grow in your spiritual maturity, becoming more and more like Jesus, because knowledge that's just here that doesn't work its way into our lives won't change anybody. It'll turn us into hypocrites. It'll turn us into phonies. It'll turn us into religious people, the kind of people that Jesus had the worst things to say about in the New Testament. But when we are vitally, truly connected with him and we are in deep love with him, we can't help but grow to become more like him. And when we do that, we do exactly what Jesus did. Engage. Engage with people around us. Engage our culture. Engage our families. Engage the world for his kingdom. Goodness. Clearly for Paul, God's credibility was without question. No one not the religious leaders, not the political leaders, not philosophers, bankers, poets, artists, or authors, not even himself, provided an assessment that was worthy of consideration if it contrasted what God had to say. Paul's contention would be the same as it was in the book of Romans when he stacked all the other opinions of the world against God's and when he said these words, let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true, and every man, including myself, be a liar. So far, we've studied five core truths, five truths that we know that God thinks about us, five different ways that we see that God is saying to you and to me, I value you. Today, we're going to add a sixth. Now, the sixth one is a simple statement. It's it's in, your, in the notes in the back of your bulletin, and it simply goes like this. I have eternal life in Christ. Now, of all the core teachings, this one claims specifically to be said to us by God because the passage we'll look at is going to portray God as a witness testifying about the veracity of this truth. So the question that has to be behind it is, do I believe God? Is God a credible source? Is he trustworthy? 1 John 5, starting in verse 9. Listen to how the message version of the Bible, it's a, a paraphrase, how it explains these two verses. If we take human testimony at face value, how much more should we be reassured when God gives testimony as he does here Testifying concerning his son. Whoever believes in the Son of God inwardly confirms God's testimony. Whoever refused to believe, in effect, calls God a liar. Refusing to believe God's own testimony regarding, regarding his son. Now, there are many in our culture and society who will testify that God is a liar. If he's there, he's a liar. Uh, there's a book out there 
written that maybe you have seen. Um, you know, we believe that God is good, and this book's title is God is Not Good. And it's all about how religion in our culture and, and around the world has been nothing but terrible for the world. And there's a growing movement that says God is not good. And when you have religion, you have horrible things. And I will tell you this. When you have religion, the knowledge that we talked about just a second ago, when that's all you have, that will make us hypocrite. It will make us racist. It will make us mean. It will make us selfish. But when we have a true and honest, vital relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, he will radically change us because the core of who we are will be love. Because that's who Jesus was. And it will cause us to engage our culture, engage our society. And that's what we want to be about. That's who we say. That, that's, that's the God that we serve. So either we believe God or we call God a liar. Because he's going to say some things about Jesus and about our salvation today that is important. So 1 John 5.11 says... And this is the testimony. Here's God's testimony. There's two parts. That God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has the life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The first part of his testimony, God gave us eternal life. One of the really cool things about the Bible is you have 40 different authors over 1,400 different years and they all speak a, the same message. So as, as John, we just read, tells us that eternal life is in Christ. So Paul says in Romans 6.23, but God, uh, the free gift of God is eternal life. God made a promise to his people. He made a promise to those who would come to him by faith. And here's his promise a couple chapters earlier in 1 John. This is what he promised, even eternal life. He promised his people eternal life. And when the first man and woman rebelled against God, we all rebelled against God. When they were driven out of his presence, we were all disqualified for a personal, intimate, 24-7, day-by-day relationship with God, and that was unacceptable to God. That's not how he wanted things to be for us. He wanted to be able to enjoy relationship with us. So part one of his testimony is he's given us eternal life. Part two is that God's free gift of eternal life was given to us through Jesus Christ, his son. He says, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Again, in perfect agreement, Paul echoes the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now why is that important? Because eternal life is not gained through our good works. Eternal life is not gained through our heritage. Eternal life is not gained by being born in a certain part of the world. Eternal life is gained only through faith in Jesus Christ. That makes us all on a level playing field. That means that when Dwayne and Merva Ann go over to, to Chiang Mai, or when Team Japan goes to Japan, or when anyone goes anywhere, if they share the gospel of Jesus Christ, those people that are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ will come to him on the same footing as you and me, acknowledging that they're sinners, understanding the horrible cost of Christ's sacrifice for that sin, dying in our place, and putting our faith and trust in what Jesus did, who, was, who died on the cross, was buried, and didn't just stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. And when we put our faith and trust in the living Savior, he radically comes into our life, and he changes us. And it's all acquired by us through this free gift. Probably the most well-known passage, and one of the clearest on this, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Somebody's phone is whistling. Go ahead and get that. To leave room for no doubt, 
Jesus continues in John 3, and this is, this is the, the verse that we, we sometimes don't even look at, we don't think about. But he, he says a contrasting thing here to what he said in verse 16. Not, not contradictory, but contrasting. And he says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Because he does not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. Either one believes God's testimony and has eternal life, or one disbelieves it, and in so doing calls God a liar, and places themselves resolutely in the state of condemnation. And that's pretty powerful when you think of it that way. So the conclusion that John reaches is whoever has the Son has life. What does it mean to have the Son? You can't have any more of a person than the person. What does it mean to have the Son? Well, we know that eternal life is a gift. It's not something that we earn. Jesus said in John 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. We have eternal life because we are his sheep, and we are his sheep because we hear his voice. And we, are, we hear his voice because we first cried out to him. Now this gift is a relationship, a relationship with a person, the person of Jesus Christ. We received eternal life not just from Jesus, but we receive, we receive eternal life in Christ, in Jesus. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Eternal life is not simply an unending life, as the phrase implies. Eternal life is a quality of life based on that intimate, personal relationship with God himself. The disciple grows to be more like him as he spends more time with him and Jesus transforms us from the inside out that's the work of the Holy Spirit as well doing that work in us so when we talk about eternal life we, we don't just think about it in terms of, of years although that's part of it John chapter 17 and verse 3 defines for us what eternal life is now this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Remember last week when we said when somebody puts their faith and trust in Christ, we read out of John 14 and 16, where Jesus said, the Father and I will come and make our home with him. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the Spirit of God dwelling inside every believer, empowering his words to transform us from the inside out, to make us the people he wants us to be. The free gift is received by faith in Jesus so that our confidence does not rest in ourselves. Our confidence doesn't rest in what we can do, how good we are. So can I say this? Our lack of confidence should not rest in how bad we are, in the things that we don't do. When we come to Jesus and we put our faith and trust in him, he forgives our sins, all of them. And then as we move forward with him in our, in our faith walk, and we do wrong and we sin, he doesn't kick us out of the family. He puts his arm around us and says, daughter, son, Let's deal with this. That's not, that's not how a son or a daughter in my family behaves. You know better. Let's work this out. That's what he does. Because he loves us. He wants relationship with us more than anything else. Because eternal life is an, an ever-deepening personal relationship with the God of the universe. You have the Son. Let that sink in. John wrote what he did about God's testimony in these verses to assure us that we can know that we have eternal life 
not just length of years, but a personal vital relationship with God himself right now. So he says in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now that should give us the utmost confidence that not only is Jesus ours, but more importantly, we are his. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. He talks about us being in his hand. And then he says, my father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. No one's getting through Jesus' hand or the Father's hand to you. Some people are afraid that that, that teaching is going to encourage us to do wrong and just live sinful lives and do the things that we shouldn't do and, and be uncharacteristic of who Jesus is in our lives. But if that's, if that's how you see that, then you have not met Jesus. You might want to make sure that you have surrendered yourself to him because coming to Jesus is not making a commitment to him because when you make a commitment, you're still in control. Coming to Jesus is getting on your knees and surrendering to him. You're in a position of a servant who says, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And then you stand as a son or a daughter and follow after your father and do what he says. That's why he starts with the connection because he wants us to know him intimately, personally. And that's why we move to love. And that gets deeper and deeper and more real and more true the more we get to know him. And we can't help but grow, not just to become more like him, but to behave like him so that we end up engaging the community and the world and the family and everyone around us because we're like Jesus. We didn't intend to. We didn't plan it. That's his plan. It's his purpose. When Sir James Simpson, the, the guy who discovered chloroform, was on his deathbed in 1870, a friend asked him, Sir, what are your speculations? Simpson replied with all the strength he could muster, Speculations? I have no speculations. And then he quoted a passage from 2 Timothy. He said, For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him unto him against that day. He knew that he knew Jesus because he knew that Jesus was a credible witness that he could trust and he could put his whole entire trust in. So who is the most credible source? What criteria do you use to determine who you will believe? Who is more credible than God? God is competent. He not only knows what he's talking about, he knows what you're thinking before you even think it, so he knows what you'll be talking about before you ever talk about it. He's competent. He's honest. You know, if, if God wanted to mislead us, he could figure out many ways to do it, but one of the reasons we have trouble in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, some of the things that God says is because even though we don't understand it, God's not going to hide his true character from us. He's honest. And I will tell you this, I do not want to worship a God, well, I'll just say it this way, I'm comfortable worshiping a God that I can't understand all of him. Because if I could, then I wouldn't need him. I need a God who understands things way more than I do and can pull things together that I can't even begin to fathom. That's the kind of God that we need to be serving, we need to be worshiping. He is honest. He's forward thinking. And he's, simply, he's not simply inspiring, he's awe inspiring. So to turn their phrase a little bit, you may believe his message because you believe the messenger. Or to shorten it even more, this won't be on the slide, but believe his message because you can believe the messenger. God is the most credible source there is. The world still seeks its humanistic political saviors, its Hitlers, its Stalins, its Maos, its Pol Pots, and only late does it learn, following the pattern of every thief, in John 10, as John tells us in John 10.10, 10, they blatantly confiscate personal property. They come only to steal. 
They ruthlessly trample human life underfoot. They come only to kill. And they contemptuously savage all that is valuable. They come only to destroy. Jesus, on the other hand, not only came to give us eternal life to anyone who would come to him by faith, but he came to give us the best quality of life anyone could ever imagine. The eternal life that Jesus imparts is not just forever. It's also a rich and full life that I can live today and every day. Jesus didn't come just to add sheep to his fold, to look out and say, wow, look at how many sheep I have, like some of us pastors do. He came to enable each one, even if there were only one of his sheep, to flourish, to grow, to enjoy the life that he gave us all. So over the last five weeks and now today, we've been talking about what God has done for us, how we can know that God values us. So let's just rehearse that real quickly. What is it that we've learned so far that is true of every person who is a disciple of Jesus? First of all, you are a new creation in Christ. Everything, old, old things are past and new things have come. You, are, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Everything you need for your life is encapsulated in, in who God is and what he wants to give to you. You are forgiven and free from condemnation. You can walk around free. You are loved and accepted completely in Christ. He accepts you and loves you just like you are. And he's working in you to change you into the person that he wants you to be. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And you have eternal life in Christ. And the credibility of these realities, the source of these realities, who is the most credible witness ever, is God himself. C.S. Lewis made this comment in, in the book, God in the Dock. The people who keep asking... If they, if they can't lead a decent life without Christ, don't know what life is. If they did, they would know that a decent life is mere machinery compared, to the thing, uh, compared with the thing we men are really made for. You see, people really, nowadays, people say they want relationship with God, or they'll say it like this. They'll say, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious. They'll say, I, I, I like Jesus, but I just don't like the church. I mean, that's like saying, I like you, but I don't like your wife. They want God, but they want God on their own terms. They don't want God on his own terms. They don't want God for who he is and as he is. They, we like a God who loves and forgives, who's merciful and kind. We rebel against the God who allows evil and does not act in ways that fit with our limited sense of right and wrong. We can't stomach a God who judges and condemns because he is the absolute standard of right and wrong. We only accept life with a God that comes to us in a way that we find acceptable. A great contemporary example of this is in the popularity of the book and now movie, the Shack. I don't know if you've read the book or if you're planning on seeing the movie. There are so many theological minds in this thing, I would recommend you not see it. But your friends and family will probably see it. So if you choose to see it, and I kind of hope you do, I would encourage you <laughs> to do it with the lens of the Bible. Thinking about what the Bible has to say. Matter of fact, I, I was thinking this morning as I was praying over my, my notes and going over them, um, I wondered if, if anybody would want to go together. And maybe we could grab a cup of coffee afterwards or maybe do a life class afterwards to discuss it. So if you're interested, the contact card in the pew in front of you, just pull that out, put your contact information, and just write the shack on it if you want to do that. Because I think it'd be a worthwhile discussion, but there's so much bad, bad, bad theology in there. Um, 
there are some things that he gets right, but there's so much stuff that's just not great. Now, the shack is a story of Mac, who grew up in the veneer of Christianity that did not prepare him to deal with the harsh and very raw realities of life. In particular, a, 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 a horrendous event where his little girl was, was murdered. One of the most troubling errors in the shack is the lack of the gospel. God in the shack forgives just because. Just because he, she, and they love. Paul Young completely leaves out the very horror that brought Mac, the main character, into his dilemma. Sin and the need to deal with it. Our culture and society doesn't want to be told they've done anything wrong. The problem is you don't have the need for a Savior unless you realize that you're a sinner who's lost and need a Savior. And so he bypasses that whole part of it, and he just says God is love. And you know what? He's right. But if you want to know what it looks like for a God to not be able to give us the, the, the intimate kind of love we're talking about in, in, in the message today and from this passage... Look at the Old Testament. Look at the sacrificial system. Look at all the things that they had to do every single year, and they never could draw close to God. And whenever anyone got close to God, he told them, back off, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Well, now we learned last week that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The God that was unapproachable now resides in us. But he did not get there. He could not get there without the cross and the cross would not have had to happen without you and me being completely and utterly lost in our sin and blood had to be shed the shack tells us that God's hands are tied to deal with the evil acts of other people the scriptures are diametrically opposed. 1 Peter 2 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were all like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And because he dealt with sin once and for all, we can come into relationship with him and we can be new creations. He can give us everything we need for life and godliness. He can forgive us and set us free from condemnation. He can truly accept us and love us completely. He can come and dwell in us, making his home in us. And he can give us eternal life, a life that is, will go on forever, but for this time on this earth is full and rich and brings complete and utter contentment to our lives all based on the sacrifice of Jesus Eliza Edmonds Hewitt was a school teacher in Pennsylvania when one of her incorrigible young men that she was trying to correct um, hit her with a heavy slate caused severe spinal injury forced her to retire from teaching making her an invalid for most of the rest of her life but she didn't let that slow her down. She continued to influence children as a Sunday school teacher and the superintendent at the Northern Home for Friendless Children. I, as I read that, I kind of wondered if the little boy that hit her with the slate was in that home. From her place of weakness, she also influenced the church, encouraging the church with words that she would put down on paper, words that... that different people began to notice and ask if they could have so they could put them to music. One of the hymns that we sang, uh, the, the hymn that we sang earlier was one of her songs. Well, I want to close with a phrase from her song, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Every one of her verses ended with this refrain. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died that he died for me. Amen. I don't care what you think. I don't even care what I think. The only 
voice that matters is God's. What does he think? I think he would say to each and every one of us, you can believe your credible God. Pray with me. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Father, for coming up with such a plan that brought death to your own son. Thank you, Spirit, for igniting faith in us and empowering that faith to transform us from the inside out and to make us new people. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus and that kind of rich life here and now is appealing to you, I would encourage you to bow your knee to Jesus right now. Acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Put your faith and trust in Him. You can pray a simple prayer with me like this one if you'd like to do that. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I, I know that I need a Savior. I put my faith right now in Jesus as the one who died on the cross for me, paying the price for my sin. I ask him to forgive me, to come in my life and change me forever. And if you're here and you have prayed that prayer many years ago, but you're not experiencing that rich and full life, I want you to pray and invite God to do the work in you that he needs to. Father, I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters. I pray that you would do the work that only you can in us. Help us to stop fighting. Help us to stop committing. Help us to surrender and to seek you and to let you do your work in us. Give us the fullness of all that you have for us to experience the full, rich life that you promised us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's give God a hand. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory that we can experience through your victory over death and hell. Thank you for the new life that you've given us, and Lord, may we walk in it as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen.